Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that passes wisdom to the next generation of athletes, coaches, and parents. And I'm your host, Coach Furtado, Justin Furtado. So in this episode, we interview high school physics teacher and assistant varsity basketball coach at Antelope High School, one of my alumni peers from Arcata High School, Andy Baranilla. Whew. This is an amazing episode. I It was very deep. We go into a lot of insight on how to connect and relate with your students, with your athletes, and how to not burn out, how to actually live a balanced life as a coach. So without further ado, you already know. Let's dive in. The Bridging Impact Podcast. I'm thrilled to have you on today to talk about how coaches can live a life with some a little bit of balance because you know coaching there's so much passion involved and we all want to give our best to all of our kids all the time but we can burn ourselves out if we do that so i'm really looking forward to that and for some context for those that are listening andy was a senior at arcata high school when i was a freshman and he, and he was a kind enough senior to give me rides sometimes to lunch and i got to feel cool when i was a freshman so it's really fun to kind of come full circle moment now have him on the podcast have him share his experience as a coach and a teacher so welcome to the podcast andy yeah thanks for having me i'm excited for this uh um i've, I've seen what you've been doing and it's 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 been really cool and i think you're doing great things so i'm happy to be a part of it Appreciate it, Andy. All right, let's dive right in. What's your definition of impactful leadership? Um, for me, impactful leadership or just being a good leader is just you inspire others to do better. Um, I think I think a lot of it's just how you carry yourself and, and how your impact on others. Um, I think it's easy to look at, uh, you know, wins and losses if we're talking coaching or, or, or stats if you're a player. But it's like, you know, there's so much more so much more that goes into leadership than just the number on the screen. Um, and I think just how you impact others, do you, do you inspire others to want to do better and, and, and galvanize the troops and, and want to be on your side? Um, for me, that that is what an impactful leader is. Yeah, I love that. Galvanizing the troops, making sure that you're, you're bringing your best self and you're uplifting others. So there's a lot we can dive into with that. But before we go into there, I know that you are a teacher and right in the pre-pod call, you guys just told me the head of the physics department. But before we get to that big win, what made you want to be a teacher? Oh, man. I mean, honestly, like, I never saw myself as a teacher. And, and it's kind of funny because I had mm -hmm. a lot of... Um, role models in my life who were like growing up who were in education. Uh, my grandma was a teacher and eventual principal and then eventual superintendent. Um, and then my mom was working at the Humboldt County Office of Education um, where I went to school. She was also on the school board. So I had a lot of educational background in my family. But for whatever reason, I never saw that as um, a career path for me um, until uh, I started started getting into working with kids a lot. I work a lot of summer camps, and, and I found a mm -hmm. real true passion for working with kids, but wasn't really sure how to connect that because at the time I was actually majoring in kinesiology. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to be a, a physical trainer um, for a sports team. Um, that was my goal. Um, and to be honest, I, I kind of found that type of field not really thrilling to me. Um, it, it didn't challenge me in the way I was wanting. So um, I also had a really good math brain, and I still do. But to me, math was something that I was really good at, but not that I really enjoyed. Just kind of one of those things, you know, I, I'm good at it, but I don't love doing it. Until I took a physics class, and that changed my whole world. Because it was math, but it was applied math to where, like, I'm really hands-on doing stuff, measuring things. Um, and so I took a physics class, and, I, and someone suggested to me, hey, you love physics. You find a true love for physics. You also love working with kids. Why don't you teach physics? And I'm like, wow, you know, I never thought of that. <laughs> and so right. I actually did a... a it's kind of like it's it's like shadowing a teacher a physics teacher um and and kind of full circle here the teacher i ended up shadowing um when i was at chico state was um the chico high basketball coach and physics teacher so we connected right off the bat because he was kind of doing everything that i wanted to do and he was just such a big inspiration for me and i saw how how much he connected to kids in multiple ways and just making physics fun and being like a, a really positive role model for kids, especially in a subject that kind of has a bad reputation as being boring and hard. And he completely turned that around. And I could, I so could see myself doing that. And that moment of spending time in his classroom and seeing what he was doing, that, that was like, I want to do that. Like, that is what I want to do. And then of course, the cherry on top was he was also coaching, which is what I'm doing now. 
I love it. So I, I, I want to ask you a little bit more. And, you know, for those that are listening, I've seen some of your videos, Andy, you kind of like, and I remember one time when I talked to you, even before we, we talked like in this most previous call, it might've been two years ago when you just started out and teaching, you were talking to me about how teaching is kind of like performing, right? Where you have to mm -hmm. kind of like master your craft and, and in terms of like how you deliver it. And like, it's like, you're telling a story through yeah. physics. And I'm curious if you talk, you talked about connecting to kids in multiple ways. Like, what did you learn from him and how do you connect physics and make it applicable yeah. for people like, you know, that are, you know, high schoolers that are like, don't really want to learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think making things relatable is, is, and showing that you care is so, so important. Probably, honestly, that's got to be step one before you even get into the actual academics or, or details, really. Um, a quote that I've heard actually from that teacher that I observed that really just has stuck with me is kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and that's always stuck with me just because I think I spend a good solid amount of time getting to know them and then from getting to know them, making the content relatable. So I have, you know, I'm not into ballet. Me personally, I'm not into ballet, but I have multiple girls in my class who are on the dance team who are super into ballet. And like, I was asking them about what are some of these moves you do? And they were showing me the spin move and it's like, okay, you know, Yes, the lesson today for in physics is about rotational inertia. Yes, that is the lesson. But I, I'm like, you know, I remember that girl is into ballet. I remember that group of kids is into ballet. So I bring them up in front of the class. And I'm like, hey, show us that move. And then we can actually do tests on her. I have this measuring system um, and these tools where we can actually measure her. And like, yes, what we're actually doing is rotational inertia. But what they see it as is Mr. B's making this class about me and he's he cares about us and the buy-in is just big. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it is it does kind of come become like a production, like a show. And it's fun that way. But at the same time, we're still doing the we're still doing the, you know, concepts we're supposed to get. But it's, it's in a way that they will buy into. And I think that's so important. Um, I've had many to be honest, I've had many physics teachers throughout my college journey and, and stuff that just kind of dove straight into the content, no backstory, no nothing. And, and I get it, you know, it's college. So I get, I get that that's more of the level of how things work, but at the high school level, it's just making things relatable and wanting kids to get excited about what they're doing. Like, wow, this, like I, ha I play a role. I matter in this room. Like I'm not just a student. I'm like the, the lesson tomorrow might be about me. The lesson the next day might be about my friend. Like uh, just making content relatable. I found the buy-in is just, like above and beyond compared to if I did not include that. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard about that in terms of like, you know, basketball or coaching, you know, trying to get buy-in from a team, but I've never heard about mm -hmm. it in terms of physics. And <laughs> I can think back to, I actually dropped out of physics in college because it was so boring and it was just like my science. I'm like, I need an easier science. This is going to be too hard and this is too boring. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a buddy in it, you know, so I didn't have that teacher to make it relatable for me to, you know, maybe do some basketball or, or, or baseball or, you know, cause there's a lot of inertia in sports, right? Yeah. Oh no. Absolutely. And so I think I, that's a real, yeah, sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say like, I love when I have athletes because a lot of the athletes hear about physics and they're like, Oh, I got to take this class. But one of my favorite things has been to change that perspective of like, Hey, you're a football player. Like we can measure different ways. Like when you tackle someone lower, when you tackle someone higher, what, how does the force change or even basketball with like angled shots? Like what is the ideal angle to, to shoot? And we, we actually, I, I did this recently. We study Steph Curry's like angles shots and, um, I, I get data on him and like, that is the lesson. But again, it's like, okay, they, they see it as we're studying Steph Curry today, <laughs> but really it's like, Hey, we're doing projectile motion. And they like, you know, it's just like that buy-in is there. And so sorry to cut you off, but yeah, totally. Oh. No, this is good. That's great. I mean, it just like the relatability is everything. It's just, it, to me, it almost sounds like it's like a fresh approach to physics. And I feel mm -hmm. like that's the approach and the innovation that's kind of almost coming into sports and to schools that are effective. Right. But, you know, can you, where have there been any challenges like with other teachers and right, obviously you don't have to, you know, name names, but like yeah, people at first are probably like, Mr. B, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> right. Absolutely. I will. So this is my third year and I will, I will be very honest. My first two years, I received a lot of pushback from, from coworkers. Um, what was lucky, the situation I was in was that was lucky was when I got hired, they told me like, Hey, the physics program has kind of gone downhill and we're, we're hiring you because we we are we want you to be the person to change it and turn it around. And so I really had good support from like my administration and my district to where like 
when I tell them like, Hey, I'm kind of receiving this pushback. Like, should I go for it? And they're like, we want you to. And, and for me, that made mm-hmm. such a big difference because I had the, I had the backing of them. So despite what coworkers would say, and I, and I get it from the outside looking in, especially if you've never seen somebody teaching the way that I do, it looks like, why are those kids just playing games all day in your class? Or why yeah, are they just, why right. are they having fun type of thing? Um, and I got a lot of comments like we don't do that here, or that's not how we run things around here. And so, yeah, I, I'll be honest. There were days that I went home very frustrated my first two years and, and, and it was not a great working environment just cause I kept being told, no, like, don't try new things. Just stick to the stick in your box, stick to stick to what we do have done the last 20 years. Um, and like I said, I was very, very fortunate to have support from my admin and district to just be like, Hey, we're with you. We want you to make these changes. We believe they'll pay off. And so they did. And, and, and you, like you mentioned early on, um, the, those coworkers that I was working with are no longer at the school and I'm now the head of the physics program. So it all kind of works out. And now I kind of, I kind of get to run the, run the curriculum for what we, what we do at our school. And, and that has been so rewarding and, and made me feel so good about kind of just sticking to it, sticking to my gut, doing what I feel is right for kids um, and putting kids first and, and it paying off. So that was, that was a big thing for me. Yeah, I hear a few things here. So kind of to recap that, I think number one is always having that mentors and support no matter at what avenue we're going through. You know, if it's basketball, having a coach be supportive, even a trainer, a development coach, parent. Um, but also, like, I feel like here you're almost talking about, like, innovation, like a like kind of like Steve Jobs gets so glorified. And, <laughs> like, you kind of, like, in- innovated the science department that was going against the grain. And, like, I feel like that should be celebrated more, like, teachers yeah. kind of, like, innovating, you know, learning and making learning fun. Yeah. Like, I yeah, didn't. Absolutely. Yeah, to- no, no, totally. I was going with what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, with that being said, and like, also, I just know that I know that you're a hard worker because I know how much work that you put into basketball. And I can just hear already from our conversation how much hard work you've put into being a, a science teacher in that, you know, you always put the kids first. And I know that you also not only you do love physics, but you also love basketball. And you yes. really, you know, talking about that hard work, that hard work, I saw you putting in a lot of hard work into basketball and becoming a lot better player than from where you were in, in high school. And so I'm mm-hmm. sure that transitioned and really helped you become an effective coach. So can you talk about your first couple of years in coaching? Yeah. So my first couple of years coaching, um, I actually my first season was 2020. Um, okay. And it was it was not, you know, obviously not the season I expected when I visualized myself coaching um, with just, you know, all the restrictions and everything going on. Um, but that being said, it was a really eye opening experience for me to be on the other end of things, you know, um, playing in high school, playing college basketball, like playing in men's leagues after that. Like yeah. it's it, it was it was definitely different to kind of get be on that side of it. But I also loved it because first off it made instant connections with kids at school like oh that's the basketball coach you know what i mean so like a lot of kids who were athletes all of a sudden would come up to me and like hey coach how's it going and and not even i had no idea who they were um and then just transitioning to coaching it, it it was a lot of work i will say it was a lot of hard work to add that thing i mean almost really like it felt like two full-time jobs coaching and teaching um, but so rewarding and just to be able to bring my experiences to the game. And, and one thing that was really fun for me is to see myself and some of the kids, you know, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't say there was like one kid that like, man, I'm exactly like you, but there were certain kids where it's like, man, yeah. you mentally, I can see my, I used to be like you or, or physical like growth. I, I used to be like you or, um, just mindset wise, I, I can see myself and I being able to kind of touch those lives and be like, Hey, you know, I care about you. And I went through what you're going through right now, like whether that be good or bad. Um, and I just want to show you, like, these were the decisions I made. You can make your decisions and, and turn out how you want to be. Um, and then just kind of giving a, some guidance, you know, um, I've seen how this goes. I've seen, I've been there. I've been there. Like, again, just being relate, relatable to them. Um, and that's been a really fun experience. Yeah, I was actually getting, that was the next question I was going to ask was about relatability. How do you translate that like relatability in physics class to mm-hmm. now like, you know, the basketball court, right? Like, I feel like sometimes, you know, players, they don't see coaches as, as you know, players that form or a coaches that formerly played. A lot of times it's just like this dictator that's just yelling at me yeah. and yelling at me. And obviously you have, and, and I have a little more of an innovative approach like yourself. I'm trying to follow in footsteps like you. 
but like, how do you like kind of, you know, you utilize your relatability skills as a coach? Um, well, I think, uh, the easy answer, which is not my full answer, but the easy answer is I'm still young. I don't look yeah. that far. I don't look that far. Yeah. And, 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 and I play with them just like, yeah, exactly. Just like yeah. you. And, you know, I, I play with them a little bit too. So like they, they know that I'm not just a guy who's never played basketball. Like I, right. I can, I can. And so, um, that's the easy answer. I think the other answer is I really try to emphasize the why, like the W H Y of everything we do. Um, because it, it, it kind of, it, this applies to honestly teaching and coaching. It's like, if kids don't know why we're doing something, it's not, they're not going to connect to it. They're not going to want to, again, buy in. Um, so, you know, and us as coaches, if we can't answer that question of why are we doing this? Why are we training this? Why is this play something worth studying? Um, why are we watching film? Then maybe it's something we shouldn't be doing if we can't answer that question. Um, so like, hey, why are we practicing this drill? Oh, because that's going to be good in this scenario when you need it here. Or why are we learning this play? Oh, because this team tends to really hedge this, so we're going to dive down there. So just always letting kids know the why of to, to make it like uh, practical. Like, I will use this. It's not just some random skill that some guy is asking me to do. It's like, I, this will benefit me, showing them how it benefits them. And, and again, I guess that relates to relatability of just always letting them know the why. We're doing this because this. We're doing this because this. And, and showing them how it will help them. I think it's very easy for kids. I've seen this as well. If they don't know the why, they're going to not have full effort into it. But if they know the why, they get the why, they understand it, I think they'll they'll be full buy-in, they'll work a lot harder, and you'll also make connections with them, which are important. Yeah, no, 100%. Connecting the, the why you're doing a drill to, you know, obviously everything has to eventually be translated into the game, right? Like, otherwise, mm -hmm. why are you doing it? And I think that's one thing that I am honestly, I'm trying to work with some of the coaches that I'm working with too, like, you know, let's, let's make sure that we connect with the kids, especially because I'm working with a lot of younger coaches. So like these kids like really don't know what, like why in the world am I doing a pivot? Like, okay, <laughs> let's show them why we're doing it. Otherwise they're just, like you said, they're 50% and blah, 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 you know, like right. bringing their foot around like a helicopter and they, <laughs> they don't really care. Right. So yeah. I think the emphasis is really important because I think that's another thing that sometimes us coaches, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk at them, but we don't emphasize, right. You know, if you're, you're holding your shot, you know, you put your hand in the cookie jar, whatever that emphasis is. And then yeah. why that emphasis is really helpful. Right. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I think just, and, and I think also, in addition to that is also getting their input. I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, I, I think some there, there's limit, there's limits with that. Like you don't yeah. want to like, Hey, draw up the game winning play for us. You know, <laughs> that, that might not be, they might not be ready for that, but like just getting their input, like, Hey, what are you seeing on the court? You know, like, are, are you seeing that they're jumping this pass? Are you seeing that their press is, you know, what, what are you seeing? And then we can work together. And I think that too, like, again, I know I say this with, it kind of, it is absolutely for teaching and coaching, it makes them feel like they're important. They're, they're seen, they're, they're, uh, they're not just the player, but they, their voice matters on the team. Um, and so taking in that input as well, um, I think has also increased kids wanting to work hard for you. Yeah, no, that input and like empowerment of like, this is actually my team as well. It's not just coach's team who's telling me what to do all the time. And, and right, it's asking the strategic questions too. Like you said, mm -hmm. you don't want to have them, you know, drawing up the game winning play. But yeah. with that said, you know, and in, in talking about relatability and emphasizing, I know that coaching also has been challenging for you the first couple of years and you had to learn about balance. Like I had mentioned yeah. at the very beginning of the podcast, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I think for me, I was, I still am. I'm so in love with basketball. Like basketball is so important in my life. Um, I can't imagine it not being in my life in some form. Um, and I think for me, I just dove straight in without really thinking about like mentally what I needed at the time. Um, and I think I just went all in with like anything that the, that, um, the program needed, I was going to volunteer for, and I was going to jump in and, and I honestly, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I burnt out my first, my first year and, and not as much, but still my, my last year as well. Um, I think I just, I couldn't say no. I think I just kept saying yes because I wanted to, I loved it and I wanted to be a part of it. But I, I soon realized that it kind of started to become a, I have to coach rather than I get to coach. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something that I pushed too hard on. Um, and I think also my free time was spent playing basketball. So I was 
I was doing my, <laughs> I was doing my teaching then after school and weekends and games and tournaments, I would coach. And then uh, the free time that I did have, I'd play basketball. So really it was like, there was no getting away from basketball. And I think, I think there is such a thing as having too much of a good thing. And I think I let basketball consume my life. And I think I didn't have that balance that I think as me as a person keeps me happy. Um, and so there, I, I, I guess I had to learn over time. It's okay to say no. Sometimes there's other coaches that can take the, the role too. There's other people that can be there. It's okay to, you know, maybe not volunteer for everything. Um, it's okay to like miss, some, you know, not obviously not miss something big, but miss, miss some of the small stuff every once in a while for yourself. Um, and then I also learned that like, as much as I love playing basketball, I didn't need to be spending every waking hour of my free time, <laughs> yeah. time playing it. So right. I started doing other things. Like I, I started hanging out with friends a little more, which um, I think obviously through COVID kind of like that kind of fell back a little bit just because of everything going on. Um, but yeah, I started reaching out to friends more and, and, you know, did I think about basketball sometimes while I was with them? Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but, of course. yeah, of course. But it was just like mixing it up, do changing things that aren't basketball. I think you, you have to, in order to have true balance, you have to have things that get you away from it to be better at the thing. And I think that's what something that I kind of made the mistake of is I thought that to be the best coach and player, I had to just do it all the time, play all the, every chance I could go to every volunteer coaching thing. Um, and, and not just the volunteer, but the actual, the, the whole responsibility of being a coach, all that. And I think what I realized the hard way was that by taking a break, it almost is like a recharge and a refuel to be better when you are there. I, I wasn't being present and by taking the mental breaks that I needed and, and doing things for me and, and going to sit by the pool instead of going to do something else, you know, yeah. basketball related. Uh, like I, I realized I started to become a better coach and, um, and, and, a, and honestly a better teacher and better friend. Um, and so I think just recognizing that was, was huge for me. And I, I really, this, this summer league and everything leading up to this and this year, I, I'm really look forward to, I feel fresh. I think I, I'm, I'm more knowledgeable of how to just be, be better. I feel like there's a lot there, right there, because <laughs> I know, I, I, I know personally, I, it, it hasn't been with basketball, but I'm a similar person where I just get super excited there, you know, about different things. If I join a new project, I go head first all the way in. And I remember talking to you on the phone and you're just like, mm -hmm. this is the biggest thing that, you know, I could see you totally doing this. And so that's actually kept me like mindful about it. Luckily, my girlfriend is like very good at being like, it's not so serious. You need to take breaks. And I'm also actually reading a book about like the power of like, a whole chapter was dedicated to like actually like high performers, like coaches, athletes, they actually take breaks and they're like pretty yeah. strategic about them. So I like, I'm kind of starting to buy into that a little bit more from our conversation. Obviously like I live with my girlfriend, so you know, you uh -huh. get you, you, that energy gets rubbed off on. But um, I think what I'd like to kind of dive in a little bit more on is just like, how did you start prioritizing that? And like, kind of what, what did that process look like? Because I'm sure like you, you kind of hit that wall, right. And you're probably thinking about quitting, but you like, you love basketball so much. Like yeah. how did you like kind of dig yourself out of that? Yeah. Well, I, I kind of just forced myself. Like I just wrote, <laughs> yeah. I just honestly wrote down in my schedule before the week started, I'm going to spend two hours with friends this week. Like I'm going to spend minimum two hours. Of I just put it in my schedule and I'm just, I'm pretty big on scheduling and planning. So like yes, when I, I write something on there, I'm sticking to it. So I just made, I just made sure to put it on there. Um, and I'll be honest, the, the first time that I said no to something for basketball, I left feeling so guilty and just like, mm -hmm. you're not going to be a good coach. The, you're letting the kids down type of thing. And I came back the next day after saying no to something. And it was like, it, it just, it didn't matter as much as I thought it would. Like I, I jumped right back in felt, and I felt better because of it. Um, so I think just over time, that repeated process was of like, okay, you know what, when I'm here, yes, I make a big difference, but it's also okay if I miss sometimes to be better in the future. Um, and just seeing that repeated process, like I said, of like, yeah, I, I did, I did not volunteer for something yesterday, but I came today and was, I had a fantastic day and I made a big impact. And, and I think just recognizing those wins and honestly, journaling them and writing them down. Like I mi I missed yesterday. That's a fact. Also a fact is I had a fantastic day because I felt mentally prepared for it today. Um, 
And I think just, you know, kind of that verbal or what verbal affirmations or, or just looking at it and being like, yeah, it, it, it's okay. Um, and I think the positive just outweigh the negatives, but it was it hard. Yes. There were like that, that guilty feeling. It was kind of eating at me a little bit, of course, but um, just over time, the positives outweigh the negatives. And I, and I think I, I'm, I'm better for it. Yeah, hundred percent. I I feel that like you when you care when you're a person like obviously you care about your students mm -hmm. you care about people like you want to socialize, mm -hmm. and it it feels you have that gut not not gut feeling but you have that feeling in you when you do say no to someone you care about which is whether it's an athlete or hey maybe it's even like a a coach coworker right mm -hmm. and you care about them you feel, you have a bad feeling because you know you want to go hang out with your other buddies or shoot you just want to sit in in your house and watch some TV and not talk to anyone right but I think. Yeah. I appreciate you for sharing that and, and letting you know the listeners know that it's not always easy and you're going to have that feeling. It's not just going to be like, oh, I want to take a break, so I'm going to do it. You know, like it's going to be those kind of push and pull. But I, I, I find that journaling, I journal as well. And just like mm -hmm. with that being said, I'm curious, like how much have you seen yourself grow as a coach? And then if you want to further expand on as a teacher in the last three years. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, as a coach, I think okay the answer is kind of the same for both just the connections i've made i think i it's it's mm -hmm. not as much surface level as it first was i think okay. i think a lot of coaches and players um or sorry coaches and teachers they might even not even really get the surface level they might hardly even get to know the kids at, at all um and i think i think just the person i am i can get to the surface level fairly easily but i think lately i've been like in the past two years three years really i've been really able to get get deeper like i i i've it's the the other coach the other coaches on the coaching staff kind of call me the uh team therapist in a way um <laughs> I, I don't know i've just i've always been especially lately been comfortable talking about feelings like and and just emotions and i think what's important is a lot of the kids especially athletes have this kind of drive to push that aside and it's just like grind sports like you know all that all the time yeah yeah just um be an animal all the time but it's like you know it's it's okay to like how are you doing? Like, how do you feel today? How's home? Um, and I think I, I really try to make a point to ask those questions to kids on the team. It's obviously easier on the team because there's only like 14 guys versus like my classroom where there's like, I have like 150. But um, so I try to make a point to each player, ask them a question like, how are you doing outside of school at least once a week? Um, and just having a sit down conversation. And, you know, there's some where I get the same answer every week. Fine. <laughs> fine fine <laughs> yeah. but then there's and there's some kids and it makes it all worth it where they're like i'm not doing well i'm like let's talk about it like how can i help you what what do you, do you want to just tell me about it like what do you need um and so that has been something that i think is growth for me in coaching i think I, to tell you the truth i think i was kind of hesitant to do that in the past i like i wanted to be this the cool coach still the young cool coach who doesn't talk about that. And I'm just like, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of one of you guys, but at the same time, kids, kids need more people that support them in their lives and, and care about how they're doing. Um, so I think for me that, that would be, uh, how I think I've grown as a coach just making those deeper connections with players outside of basketball. Yeah, no, I, that, that's huge. I feel, I mean, the, the big word that you we're talking about is, is listening and just mm -hmm. being, being really curious and genuinely caring about, your athletes outside of, of basketball because at the end of the day like basketball is going to end basketball is going to end for lebron mm -hmm. james it's, it ended yeah. for michael jordan they can play pickup but they got a life after that like it doesn't yeah. last forever so and it, it, for both of our programs and most of the kids we coach they're not going to play past college if they're lucky and if some of them the mm -hmm. best of them will probably play in overseas or g league or at best right right like it's very very challenging so really i feel like for me, that's one of the biggest things that I've tried to kind of implement into my philosophy as well is just like getting to know the kids and building relationships and building relationships yeah. with other coaches and just like hearing people out and making people yeah. feel like they belong. And because it's so easy, it's very challenging. I feel yeah. like sometimes you you're, you're, giving, you're giving me chills right now. Just hearing that that's 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 really what it's all about. That's, that's you're what right. it's all about. Yeah, you're giving me chills just, just hearing that. Like, um, you're totally right, dude. Uh, it's just, you know like kind of what you said like basketball will end and at the end of the day they're a person and so that that kind of that kind of that comes first um but what you're saying that that's that's totally what it's all about just being there for them and uh being someone who who cares in their life who matters and who who wants them to succeed
So I'm curious, like as, as a teacher, like how do you cultivate in that in your classroom, right? Because I imagine, you know, I do some reading and I substitute te- taught this year. And it's okay, just like some of, some of the schedules are really rigorous. Like they don't really, you know, like don't even get me started about cut down on recess time. But, no. um, <laughs> you know, they, I just feel like there's not a lot of like room or design in pedagogy, you know, for like, just like learning and being or not even learning, but I mean, just like connecting and being human. And like, yeah. do you, do you carve out five to 10 minutes in your classes or, or your, you know, basketball to like talk or how, how do you approach yeah. that? So you're talking mostly in the classroom. Uh, let's, yeah, we'll start classroom first. And okay. then I know you're assistant coach, so that might, you might yeah. have a, you know, it's a little different cause you're under someone else's schedule, but I'm curious right. for you as someone who creates a schedule, like how you bri- yeah. build that. Yeah. In. So honestly, I build it in rather than dedicating like, Hey, five minutes, we're going to like connect. I kind of just build it into like every day, like, you know, and asking questions, like, uh, always just kind of walking around. So like, yes, they might be working on a problem, but I'll walk around and be like, Hey, Joe, like, what do you, what do you got going on this weekend? He'll tell me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to remember Joe Mm -hmm. like skateboarding. And then I, then I can like, and then just kind of, it's, it's all just inter intertwined throughout it. Um, I also do do a, a community circle and that's something that I just, I've decided that's a non-negotiable for me. I'm going to make sure to make time for that. Um, we do a community circle once every two months. Um, so, you know, yes, I make the, the academic schedule and yes, it can be rigorous with just things with so much going on, but I make sure that there's a day dedicated every two, at least every two months for community circle. And it's, um, what that looks like in my classroom is all physics stuff is put away. We're just, we're just sitting there and there's some prompts on the board and the prompts include deeper level questions. Like, uh, one that I'm going to do here, um, coming up is the first question is who is proud of you and what are they proud of you for? Or who's, yeah, like who's someone that's proud of you in your life and what are they proud of you for? And I give the kids five minutes, to just write down, um, their answer. And then, um, I give them opportunities to share with each other in their table groups or, and then the chance after that is to share with me. Um, it's like think, pair, share. Uh, and that I have found is so deep and you'd be surprised how many kids are, are in tears during that time. And sometimes not even tears for when themselves are reading, but when they hear others. Um, and so just carving out time to make sure that happens, like that's like really like the, the final result, but really to get to that point, to get kids to open up like that is all intertwined throughout the months and days leading up to that. Um, just getting to know them, asking questions. I think I'm also a very vulnerable teacher. Like I tell them about me, um, and, and what go like, you know, I think it's funny because a lot of kids think teachers are just like, they basically live at school. They live and wake up at school and they don't have any outside lives. But so I, tr- and I try to tell them like, yeah, I got this going on. Um, and then I got this and, um, I'm kind of dealing with this. I, I also participate in the community circle as well. Um, and uh so so yeah just kind of fostering that fun environment i I also you know me i'm I'm a big jokester i I mess around with them and i try to create this safe environment where they feel like you know what like i can mess around with my teacher a little bit yes there's a mutual respect and and that is there and that's established but you know they they can joke with their teacher and laugh with their teacher a little bit like um it's a safe place for them to come and learn and and feel comfortable um so yeah I, i think it's it's just kind of intertwined throughout throughout the um time and like you said earlier asking a lot of questions like making them feel like i want to learn about them and because to be honest i do yeah you do yeah you genuinely do want to learn about them i have a couple of questions number one would be so i'm coaching you know like i told you i'm the head coach of the frost soft team i'd love to do some sort of community circle right but i'm not going to do that the day after tryouts right (laughs) that's probably something you know i'm thinking about uh like if, if you know if i'm a coach you know how do I set up a community circle to be successful for my team or my classroom? Yeah. Are you talking like, are you talking like early, early on, like day after tryouts type of thing? No, or? no. I'm, I, I'm talking like, I want to be realistic. Like, again, you have to build that trust first right. and, and that trust takes that, you know, like I have a, I heard a stat and I kind of feel like it's somewhat true that you have to have at least 15 hour interactions, one hour interactions with someone before, like you can really like even 
remotely get past sur surface level, which I feel like is is probably true. And there's pr definitely significant nuances with that. So like, yeah. it, I don't think a community circle would probably work, you know, day one. Right. But if I wanted to implement that, you know, come, you know, let's say we start in like, I, I think we start in September or, or October. Um, so it's coming up, right? But maybe in December or January, how, how would I approach, you know, starting? Yeah. That? Yeah. Um, I think, so I actually ran one the past year. So I, I, I pretty much took exactly what I did, took from my classroom, but I added a little bit more, um, kind of easing them into it. Cause again, I think athletes tend to have a little bit of walls up, you know, exactly like, boys. Yes, absolutely. Not wanting to show emotion and stuff. So, you know, the first, the first couple questions were like, you know, who's, who's your favorite NBA player and why, um, you know, just, just, very surface level. Uh, and then it gets to like, who's someone that's you first think of when you think about your basketball journey, that's really helped you. And it gets to that. And then it starts to break down away from the game, away from basketball, but kind of starting out with basketball. Cause that's obviously the, something they all have in common. Mm -hmm. But, um, after that getting into more like the, almost the same questions, who's really, who's someone that's really proud of you and what are they proud of you for? And, and then, uh, you know, what's your definition of success in life? Um, what makes you truly, truly, what activity makes you truly, truly happy that's not a sport? Um, and, and, and again, just, you know, because a lot of kids, it's easy to say basketball, basketball, basketball. But it's like we want to get to know you at a different level. And I think one thing I have found is that if I'm the first one to share, it makes it easier for the, the kids to share. Like if I just say, okay, your guys, is, like we're going to do this and, you, and I'm not a part of it, you guys share when I think they see that I share and if I share like a fairly deep answer, they're more willing to open up a little more and, and drop those walls. Um, so I think being in on it with them is, is a key thing that really makes a difference. You have to role model what you are expecting. I think that's, that's a big thing, right? Like, so yeah. they, they don't, they don't know how a lot of times how to be vulnerable, right? Like, mm. you know, I'm almost like my question to you is like, where did you almost learn all this curiosity? Where did you learn how to do this community circle? Was that taught in school? Because like, I feel like that's how we learn is we learn from other people. So yeah. then you have to demonstrate it for your students or your players. Yeah. Um, I, I totally agree. And in terms of where I learned it from, I think um, I actually, I actually like started therapy myself um, two mm. years ago and it's just opened up my world to like, you know, learning deeper stuff about myself and then being able to kind of be like, man, I, I bet a, a, some of these kids have never been asked that in their life. Like just certain questions and kind of learning that um, it's, it's allowed me to be more vulnerable and, and by being more vulnerable, I've, I've made deeper connections with people, um, and been able to build that trust to ask them those questions. Uh, and I think I've always kind of just had a curiosity with the mind and emotions. I think that's been something I've been curious about for a long time in my life. Um, and, and I've also just seen, you know, the strugg struggles kids go through, then that comes from being a teacher, like seeing the kid crying in the hall when you thought that kid was the happiest kid in the world. Like, and just seeing the behind the scenes and then being able to be like, you know, I, I might, as a coach, I might see you as a basketball player. Like that's how I interact with you. That's what we have, but you're, this is so much more than that. Um, and so building up to the points where we can ask them that and, and just showing care and showing love to these kids that, you know, something that was eye opening for me is um, kind of makes me emotional to talk about, but like for some of these kids, I might be the only adult figure that they can trust in their life. And, and, and I say, I, but I mean, like as a coach, you might be the only, um, person a, that's an adult that they can trust in their life. And it's, it's, it's been really sad to see, but also like empowering, like, man, I, I got to make a difference for this kid. Like I want to make a difference for this kid. This kid has potential to be a great person, player, anything. They just need someone to believe in them and, 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 believe and for them to be believing themselves. So I feel a sense of responsibility that you're kind of taking ownership over of like, I have this opportunity to be to I get to be a positive role model in their life. So I'm going to, you know, obviously go above and beyond and care and give them everything I got. But that also mm -hmm. means I have to, you know, sometimes turn it off and do do things for me so I can really serve them at the highest level. Yeah, absolutely. And And I'll be honest, it's a hard balance. It's, it's a hard. really hard balance because you might be on your last 
as a coach, you might be on your last straw, of the, uh, not anger wise, but like the last mental capacity that you can take, you know, and then you have a kid that day as you're, as you think, as you're thinking, you're about to go to your car and head home and relax. There's a kid waiting in the parking lot who doesn't have a ride home. And you learn about that kid and like, yeah, you, as a coach, you might be done for the day, but there's certain cases where it you're needed, you're called. And, and, and I think, yes, I, I know I'm kind of giving conflicting answers here. Yes. You need to take time for yourself. Absolutely. Like do what you need to do to, to be the best, but in those little moments where you can make a difference and it's not going to completely over overwork you and, and make you like, uh, just too, uh, I guess stressed, you got to take it. Cause that, that will be it to you. It might be just another day or just another kid. But for that kid, that yeah. might be the changing moment in their life that they needed to get on the right track. And, and I've seen it. Um, I, I, I've seen how small moments can like a, a ride home with uh, some talks on the ride home can, can put a kid who could be on one really hard path and tough path to like, they're back on track, at least for now, they're back on track. Um, so yes, I, I know it is conflicting. Like, yeah, you got to take time for yourself, but also like there's times where it's like, just go for it, go for it. Cause you'll make a difference. I don't think those are conflicting answers. Actually. I think because you're one week, you know, for the teacher, for the coach, like, I feel like for most people that work with people, your schedules are going to look different, right? Mm -hmm. And your energy levels are going to look different. And there will be those times, right. Where we're called upon where the a majority of the people that are listening is their teachers, their coaches, their people that care. Yeah. And when you're a person that cares, there's going to be times where you're called to serve and you have, you're, you know, to talk about iPhone batteries, you're on 5%, mm -hmm. but you know, you're going to use that last 5% because that 5% might go 60 to 80% for that other person that you are impacting. Yes. So I think, you know, just like sometimes we have to be unselfish and we're going to be tired. Maybe it's, you know, only get five or six hours of sleep and, mm -hmm. or maybe even less, who knows, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm a big believer in sleep, but, uh, you yeah, know, just like really, really, really going above and beyond when, when the time is called. And I feel like, a great teacher and a great coach, they have that intuition to know, like, I need to help, I need to reach out and help this kid or this player. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And I, th and I think there's times to realize, like for you, for example, like sometimes you're coach for Toto or I'm assuming, is that what you go by? Yeah. Like, it's the, it's the brand name. Yeah, whatever, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, just recognizing like sometimes, yeah, you're coach for Toto and sometimes you're just Justin and yeah. it's okay to show kids both. Like, yeah, we're, we're in the gym, we're on the court, we're working hard. I'm coach for Toto. But this, like when the whistle blows, I'm Justin, what, how can I, how can I help you as a person to a person? Mm -hmm. How can I be there for you? Um, that was a really big one for me that I was told is like, Hey, you're being too much coach B right now. And like, we, we <laughs> like, uh, you need to take time for Andy, you know? Um, so I think that that is key as well. Um, and, 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 and you're right. Just having this, this balance of, you know, taking time for yourself, doing the right thing and knowing that it's okay to stop and take a break to be a better person overall and coach. I feel like that's a perfect place for us <laughs> to ask the final question of our podcast, which is just, you know, what is your final advice for, for coaches, teachers, and leaders of the next generation of youth? And then with that, where can people, you know, find and connect with you if they, you know, want to learn and, and talk to you about, you know, coaching, leading, teaching, anything that we talked about? Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess to connect with me, um, Instagram would, would work. Uh, it's just Andy Baranilla. Um, there you a go. A-N-D-Y-B-E-R-O-N. I L L A. Um, and then, uh, in terms of my advice for n new coaches, um, to just take on the next generation, I would just say this, the quote that I, I guess I said, I'd started with kids don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care and showing them that you care will go so much further than just showing them how much, you know, or your stats or how good you were when you were younger and just all the skills that you have or the wins and losses showing them that you care, the buy-in will be incredible and it will be so worth it. And you'll, you'll make a huge difference to a lot of people's lives and in your own. Wow. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Andy, Andy, I appreciate you on this podcast. Like I, I, 
I got a lot out of this and I have a full page of notes and, you know, like I really do appreciate your time and sharing wisdom. We share, we share a lot of similar philosophies. So it's always great to connect with other people that, you know, are, are innovating and, and really caring about kids because that's what it's all about. Yeah, of course. I agree. And I, and I, I appreciate you again for having me. This, this was really cool. I had a lot of fun doing this. This was deep talk. This is, this is the type of deep level stuff I like talking about. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts. And this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward make an impact on the world so stay tuned stay subscribed cheers